Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? Can you hear me? Hey, sorry, I had my speaker turned off. Uh, oh, no problem. How are you? Good. How are you doing? It's good to have you on live here. I'm well. Am I the only one or we got other people up? We have one other so far. Asande uh, Abravan is on. I don't think he's activated microphone or, mm. or camera yet. And I'll apologize in advance. I might go on mute. Uh, my dog is here, so she occasionally likes to chime in. Okay, anytime you want to, and, and but don't worry about dogs because I love dogs. Very good. She may make a cameo. I don't know. She's roaming around here somewhere. How are you holding up with all of the uh, craziness going on? A lot of trial design? Uh, a lot of trial design under uh, extreme emergency um, time pressures. And I just feel incredibly lucky that the... Um, the only thing I have to deal with is internet bandwidth. I mean, I look at I look at all of the people. Hey, Isadell, how are you? I I, I look at all the people that um, have jobs that have been almost wiped out by this crisis, and um, for the, those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work from home effectively, it's just a it's just pure luck. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'm lucky that I have flexibility as well. And I'm still waiting. My company may pivot and do some work on COVID-19 as well. Just waiting to hear from my pathologist if he needs a grant written like really quickly. So I'm kind of in the same boat, but i um, very fortunate to be in a position to help. But it's crazy. It's, it's hard to believe what's going on. It's funny because even when I was back in college, you know, we had the H5N1 scare. And I remember yeah. doing like an extra credit project with one of my lab partners about the possibility of that pandemic. And it's it's just hard to believe that we're here and, you know, all these years later. But I guess it, it could be worse. It could be Ebola. So yeah, <laughs> trying to find the silver linings. It's incredibly bad. And one person said that for people living in the U.S., um, it's actually worse than if you were living in the U.S. during World War II. It's, have, it's having more effect on daily life of those who are living here than, it, than wow. World War II did, which is quite amazing. Yeah, that's telling. Well, I guess yeah. it is a war. It's just a different kind of war. Yep. So I guess I can, I can highlight some material or, or do you all have any uh, things you would like to highlight or have, ask questions about before we do anything else? I do not, I don't know if anybody else does. So I said at any time. Uh, I said here, ask. hello, hi. Oh Brian. good, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah perfect. You sound uh, good and the, and the picture's good. Is it good? That's my love, painting. <laughs> I love the colorful background. It looks like balloons. That's my painting. I used That's to paint yours. A lot. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is beautiful. Thank you did you. this. I did, yeah, maybe. So, wow. eight years ago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Thanks very much. So, I'm talking to you from Manchester, UK. So, I made. Um, postdoc in uh, University of Manchester, based at the Christie Hospital. Oh, good place to uh, be. Uh, yeah, I'm a medical physicist, uh, working a lot with data mining, big data analysis, mostly uh, for long calculations. Um, so I'm very happy, so I'm following um, uh, you on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I just saw a site in the Twitter, actually, so I think some of my colleagues are unaware of the Zoom that is happening now. So I emailed them, so hopefully. Well, good. This is, yeah. this is pretty, pretty much an experiment um, because I've not used Zoom in exactly this way, although I'm using it for all of my regular teaching at the university where I have 12 students in the class and, and we already know each other. So uh, this is this kind of experiment, but I'll learn as, as I go and you all can give me pointers. So we might just go through some of this material and just let you stop me uh, when there's something you want to talk about. So this, 
Uh, and this is a new format I've, I've written over the crisis. I, I had some need to get my mind off the global news. And so I wrote a, an R program that converts my, uh, all of my uh, LaTeX material into R Markdown. And so this is the result of that. And I think I'm going to be using this format going forward, but it could probably be improved upon. There's one thing broken right now, which is the uh, the dynamic table of contents with multiple levels of table of contents is, is currently not working. Hope to have that fixed within a couple of days. And this document will show that. Um, but there's sound throughout and uh, a few videos and then a, a link to the data methods there that will get you to the topic for uh, for today and, and also the last uh, session. So this is a data set that we already started to analyze, which is from uh, Rosner's biostatistics book, um, looking at lead exposure of kids who live near lead smelting plants. And we had criticized the published analysis because they had a threshold for lead exposure uh, and, and used really a low power analysis, making the lead exposure like significant lead exposure, yes or no, for one year and the next year uh, versus looking at it as a dose response. So now we look at it as dose response. And if you do exploratory analysis, you'll see that the relationship is very linear and there's, there's absolutely no threshold uh, for lead exposure. It's just the more the worse, as you would think. So the, the previous analyses were really not consistent with that, but this one is. So this is part of a chapter that's introducing the RMS package in R. Um, so I'm not gonna go over that general part at the front of the chapter, but just use this to analyze this data set. And so we bring the data set in from the, uh, our data set area and then annotate it a little bit to make some of the output better. And then look at the, uh, the data dictionary and nothing much because we just reduce it down to four variables. But when you start looking at the data, one of my philosophies is that you you always want to be um, you always want to be close to the data. Sorry, I forgot to admit somebody from the waiting room. So sorry about the delay there. Welcome. Um, and so when you when you're first analyzing a data set, you really you really want to be close to the data, and uh, and that means the raw data. So you really want to look at what you've got. So this is just one way to do it, plus all the summary stats. And so I really like to insert little pictures into our regular sort of uh, summaries. So you can see the lead exposure. Um, lead exposures in 73 uh, tend to be lower, um, much lower than in, uh, I'm sorry, lead exposures in 73 are higher than lead exposures in 72. So we have, um, Let's say the median is 34. Well, the mean is smaller. And the median is smaller, the mean is smaller. So, um, yeah, right now I'm, I'm looking at this distribution and saying, why is that distribution looking uh, smaller? But the, the catch is the scaling. So the scaling is, uh, this is scaled from 15 to 58. So this is 15 and this is 58. And this is scaled from one to 99. So that's one and that's 99. So you do, it, it gets a little confusing with the scaling there. But we see a pretty broad range and, you know, semi-uniform distribution for us to be able to look at the dose response relationship and so we're just going to fit the most basic model, uh, which I don't have any reason to doubt. But as you, as you all know, uh, when you're giving a result to someone, your result is heavily influenced by three things, at least three things, the experimental design, uh, the model that you chose, and the data. And, um, and so we want our result to depend on the data a lot. And if your data set isn't big enough, it will depend too much on your model assumptions. And of course, even if the data set gets bigger, your model assumption might still be uh, strong and they might be wrong. Uh, so if we're assuming um, 
a nice distribution of the residuals and linearity in these three variables, um, you see that you've got uh, 99 uh, observations, 99 kids, and we've got, we explain this much variation in this maximum finger wrist tapping score. Uh, so that's a pretty decent R squared, but the vast majority of that is coming from age. So this is really pointing out um, that when you're looking at any sort of performance measure or neurologic or anything related to cognitive development, uh, you know, you really need to adjust for age. And if the lead exposures are different for kids of different age, that's really, really important. Uh, so the previous analyses didn't really adjust for age. They were really doing an ANOVA. And so the age, age here is just a super dominant variable. That'll have a chi-square of 64. Um, and we'll see that another way, I think. And there's your coefficients. And then we look at the um, specifications of the model uh, to get more detail. And so we just see the data going in, how many degrees of freedom each thing got. What is the transformation of the variable? It's as is. In other words, we did not transform it. And then we got so just some ranges for making plots. These are just default ranges that the RMS package computes. So the first thing we're going to do is to find out what is a representation of the fitted model. Um, and you can use LaTeX. Uh, there's a LaTeX function that will get this, and that will work in R Markdown fine. And so you can get the algebraic form of the fitted model or the R form. So this is the R form. So this is a working function. So in, in my packages, something that starts with a capital letter is not a computational function, but it is a, oh, I gotta admit somebody else. Hey Mike, uh, welcome to the meeting. And I'm sorry I kept you in the waiting room too long. I've gotta be more aware uh, when somebody's in the waiting room. Um, so when you're getting the R representation of a model, it's just another way to help you understand the statement of the model. Uh, the LaTeX representation gives you the full statement of the model, including the distributional assumptions. You can turn it back on now. <clears throat> All right, we hear you, Mike. Welcome. Um, hey. Hey. And so the... This is an R function that you can evaluate to get predicted values instantly. And uh, it's not a very interesting function because there's no nonlinearities in, in the uh, model. If we had spline functions or other or polynomials or interactions, this would be a more interesting thing. And you would see brackets or parentheses factoring out certain things. Uh, so you can evaluate your predictions. Let's say we want to get the uh, the expected finger wrist tapping score for a 10 year old who had a 21 level lead exposure in 72 and either a 21 or a 47 in, in 73. So that means we've really got two combinations of covariates. We're only varying one of them. And these are our predicted values. Uh, and it's just evaluating this equation here. So this is just a nice way of using some features of R, but uh, normally, you're going to get predictions by just saying, what is a data set that contains all of the values we want to give predictions for? And we see, uh, we get the same predictions as before, but now we can get the standard error of the prediction, which you can't get from the other method. Uh, but more to the traditional analysis, we just, um, we do our residual plots. And so if you look at the Y hat, which is your predicted mean, uh, versus the residual from the model, you see the most almost perfect sort of graph that you would like to see uh, with a little bit of exception down here. But, you know, this is almost uniformly constant variability, just pure noise with just a very slight expansion there too. So, and if you plot any covariate versus the rigid residuals, you should see the same pattern. So we see that with age, we see that with lead 73 exposure. Now, a little bit related to what we might be seeing here, we're seeing an amazingly beautiful QQ plot, except for this point and systematically these points. So this is checking the normality of the residuals, which is a good diagnostic to be doing. And 
the scary part about statistics that statisticians are really not liking to admit is that whenever we look at diagnostic plots, they're, they're really subjective. So how much do you worry about this? What effect does this have? So this is looking a little worrisome. So it's suggesting that uh, once you get past a certain level, the transformation of the dependent variable may be okay, but maybe not, not in the left tail. So it may be the lower score. I'm assuming this is the left tail of the raw data. Could be the lower scores are um, part of the scale that's really not linear, or it could be the upper scores. So this is a little bit worrisome, but to do anything about that would take a lot more, uh, a lot more advanced analysis than what we're currently doing. So I tend to, as earlier chapters discussed, I tend to really emphasize semi-parametric models because if I if I just make this outcome variable ordinal, uh, the transformation is irrelevant and uh, it, that makes it much more robust. So any questions about any of this stuff? So these are just very standard uh, sorts of diagnostics. And then uh, partial, uh, partial effect plots are my favorite sort of plots from models. So we're just gonna vary one variable at a time and hold the other variables constant. And since we didn't tell it what to hold it constant to, um, it's gonna put it at the median. So when you vary an age, set this to its median, set this to its median and then you have confidence band. So we've assumed linearity for everything. Uh, a simple change here, like if you said plot P instead of ggplot, you'll get a plot like graphic that's interactive for this output. Now we're saying, uh, give me a plot of just age effect, and it's telling you what the other things are adjusted to. These are their medians. So just, just getting one graph. And then we can say, well, we really want to plot it over the range three to 15 years. So that's, that's how we do that. So it's easy to take, take control. And have, now we're doing it over a finer grid of points, which would be necessary if you have a nonlinear relationship. We can get confidence intervals for individual predictions or for means. And so the individual predictions are going to be much wider confidence intervals. And now we're going to do uh, both on one. So we've got confidence interval for an individual child's uh, finger wrist tapping score. And now we've got a confidence interval for the mean of the population of children at that age. And we're just combining those two and plotting them. And you see it's way easier to predict a group mean than it is to predict the individual result in one child. So these are just kind of standard outputs. Um, we can get the lead 73 effect adjusting age to three years, which will just shift this whole graph up or down. Um, it won't change anything fundamentally because we did not allow age to interact with LD73. So if age could interact, this, this would give you um, an age dependent shape or slope. And you would really see that here. You would have these two lines not being parallel if these two variables had been allowed to interact in the model, which we did not. So we're just plotting for two different ages. So the second variable that's listed here just becomes the vertical dividing variable. But when you've got two continuous variables, it's nice to look at them in their full resolution. And so we have three, at least three different formats for that. We have the um, uh, image type of heat map plot, which is one of my, uh, one of my favorites. Um, and so the, the color, the saturation and the color are uh, telling you the predicted value. And this is your scale for the expected finger wrist tapping score, the cognitive test. Uh, what's the expected level of that as a function of these two if age is set to its median, which is 8.4 years. So you can see these are, this is what linear relationship looks like with um, uh, two 
continuous variables and your third dimension is the predicted value. Um, and we can, let's see, somewhere I thought I had a 3D plot and maybe, maybe I didn't, uh, but you can easily plot this with a 3D plot. We may see that in another example, or you can do a nomogram. This was my longest bit of code I've, I've written in R. Uh, took a lot, especially when you have nonlinear effects and non-monotonic transformations and interactions to convert a model to a plot. But I think it's it's become less of a, a tool to use in the field now that we have handheld devices for getting predictions from models, but it's more of an educational device for understanding the model. So the way you see linearity is these tick marks are equally spaced, equally spaced. The way that you see one variable is almost irrelevant is that the scale is short. So you can vary, once you know the latest lead exposure, the previous exposure is irrelevant. And if you vary that, you don't change the points very much. But the nomogram just converts every variable to common scale. And then you just uh, take those points and add them up and you get total points. And those total points are converted directly to your predicted value. And when you have survival models, you'll see that you have multiple axes for the predictions. You'll have predicted one year survival, two year survival, and all sorts of other stuff. But this is just a regular linear model. Does everybody see how to interpret these things? So you see shape, strength, um, and you can put it all together to get predictions. You just cannot get confidence intervals. Then we can get point estimates for partial effects, which I usually don't recommend. Um, now, in the case that we have here, if you go back to, um, to any of these graphs, you can see that a point estimate for a partial effect makes sense because if I wanted to know the effect of raising age from nine to 12 years, that would be this difference here. That's the same as raising age from six to nine years. And that's three times as much as raising it from six to seven years. And so uh, when you have linearity, you can reduce things to a point and you don't really miss anything. If you have nonlinearity, that's really not such a good idea. So you have to use this with caution. But when you have things that are not turning on you like a non-monotonic relationship, this, this is a semi-safe thing to do. And so what we do is to say, what is the effect of raising age? This is just its default, 25th percentile to 75th percentile. That is a 5.8 age uh, year difference. And our estimated effect is to raise the finger wrist tapping score by 15. So that's a really large effect. So that's just the maturation of the kids in having this cognitive um, um, sort of, uh, ability. It's a motor, motor cortex sort of summary, I guess. And we have confidence intervals for that mean difference. So that's a mean difference. You have confidence intervals. Now what about 72? Well, 72 doesn't matter much. 73, the quartiles, and these might be meaningless points and you don't want to always use this. this. Um, the quartiles are 24 to 37, which is a 13 unit difference of lead exposure dose. And if you went from there to there, on the average, you're gonna lower your, your cognitive test score by three units. And you get a confidence interval for that. So that's, those are useful point estimates. And when you get into logistic models, this will be replaced here by odds ratios. Um, you can change the reference value of age when you're making your predictions. And you can see that that didn't change anything because uh, age doesn't interact with anything. But we can change our interval for the prediction. So if we wanted to say the lead exposure uh, for 73 between 20 and 40, you get this estimate instead of the one we had for the inner quartile range. This, a really key point here is 
you don't want to look at this and say that there's no evidence that the 1973 lead level is uh, associated with the score. And the reason for that is these two variables are collinear. And this is asking the question if the lead 72 level did not change, but we could change the lead 73 level, what evidence do we have for a change in the mean of Y? So that's, that's kind of an illegitimate question. That's a question we should not ask most of the time because you cannot hold this one constant you know, the lead plants don't move in and out of neighborhoods within a year. Uh, so you can't hold this constant and look at that variable. So you would really need to change these jointly to get meaningful confidence intervals, or you would need to take the lead 72 out of the model. And in that case, uh, this interval here would not include zero anymore. So even in this simple model, there's a couple of nuances. Uh, and this is when you plot these point estimates. This is plotting the last one we calculated. So you just get the point estimate for difference in means and you get various confidence levels according to how shaded, how dark that, that interval is. Let's see, we already got some predictive values. This just shows how you can get them for all kinds of combinations of individuals. And we just have a whole bunch of predictive values. And we can do it manually. We can do it with a function function. And then we can get ANOVA. This is our classic sort of regression ANOVA. So we have our sums of squares explained by each variable after you adjust for all the others. So you can see age is explaining 5,900 out of 7,500 possible. So this is the limit of how much we can explain from these three variables if linearity and additivity hold. And age explains uh, a huge amount of the total explainable variation. And then you have some expl explanation from the last lead exposure, not much from the previous. And we have tremendous evidence that something is associated with the outcome. Now, this is where we do something that's a little bit smarter. Uh, when you're looking at lead exposure, you want to ask um, not whether a competing variable is related to the outcome, like, like is, is this related to the outcome adjusted for that? Don't ask that question. Uh, at least ask it with a lot of fear. But ask uh, what sort of joint explained variation in the outcome is due to these two combined collinear variables. So now, instead of getting, see, you had a 295 and a 9, you get, um, you get a total of 747. So these do not add up. This is much bigger than the sum of these. So these are hurt by competition, collinearity, and this is not hurt at all. So this would be a much better summary of your evidence for lead exposure against the outcome. Anybody have any comments about any of that? You can get uh, the ANOVA table printed in different formats so that you know exactly what's being tested. It lists here what every line is testing, like this is testing all three variables. And, uh, or you can say what subscripts of the betas in the model are being tested or you can use dots. I use this a lot uh, when I have complex models where I have terms for nonlinear effects and interactions. You'll see uh, the test for a main effect. You'll have a dot here and a dot out here in the interacting part. So this will be the combined test of the main effect plus the interactions with that variable. So you'll see like dots over here, dots over here. So it helps you understand what's being tested looking at the variables in order and this would be the, the, the one, position one is the age of variable beta one. So any questions about that, that whole analysis? Any concerns? So just to overview uh, a few more things in the chapter 10, which is where we left off in the last session, this is just getting into two-way ANOVA. 
So that's just so easy to handle with regression. So we've got um, three types of diets and we've got male and female and we want to do a two-way model. Uh, two-way ANOVA usually means like a factorial design where you actually are controlling the factors. We're not doing that here, but we may have randomized the three diet groups. So we've got two parameters for, for diet and one parameter for sex. And you just have to be good at interpreting what the parameters mean and what sort of tests are meaningful to run if you want to do any tests at all and not just contrast. So you need to know how to interpret partial effects. So that say beta two is going to be the comparison of LV with NOR. So it's going to be the comparison of this category with the omitted category, which is the reference group, which goes into here. So LV is the difference in means between beta two is difference in means between S, uh, LV and NOR if you're comparing males with males or females with females. And since we did not allow interaction, it doesn't matter whether you're comparing males or comparing females. It doesn't matter at all. We're just not changing the sex at the same time. We're changing the diet. But when you have interaction, then that changes. So we've got treatment now two levels and we've got sex two levels. And our reference cell is gonna be female treatment A. And so you have, this is your model for the mean Y. If you're, um, yeah, this, this whole thing is the model in general. So you have the effect if you're male, you have your oil or intercept, the effect if you're in treatment B, and then you have a special effect of treatment if you're a male. So this is the additional effect if you're both male and treatment B. And so that is your um, non-additive or interacting effect. So this, this expression here is, is just multiplying these two indicator variables. And so this gives you the interpretation in great detail. And you can get any contrast you want and you might just lay out all four possible means. And by subtracting rows of this, you can see what parameters are left and that tells you what you're testing. Now, this is a, kind of a hot topic in medicine under the name of heterogeneity of treatment effect, which would be much better called uh, differential treatment effect. And so uh, this is where you need to look at interaction terms and see if there's any evidence that a treatment effect varies over the type of person in any sort of predictable way. And we're seeing a lot of misunderstandings in the literature. And so this was a really excellent study that had an opportunity to do things right and they elected not to do that. So this is a study, um, this was a topic on Twitter yesterday among some cardiologists. What is the evidence that if you have a genetic variant um, and you make use of that knowledge that you can get better treatments in cardiology? And so this is one of the most studied genetic variants which is the CYP2C19 allele and this clot busting uh, drug clopidogrel, um, patients that have this variant have worsened metabolism of clopidogrel. So you would think they would have um, less clinical effects. So is there evidence for an interaction between the genetic class and the treatment effect? So this study had a chance to do that. And um, they had a design error in the in the beginning, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, so they, they studied 12,000 patients, that's the good news. Um, that, that sounds like it should be a fantastic study, but they forgot that when you're doing interaction, the sample size needs to be bigger, not smaller. And so instead of making the sample size bigger so that you really can assess the interaction, they made it smaller. 
So they only genotyped uh, well less than one half of the patients in the clinical trial. This is a, a major design flaw. Um, and the way it surfaces is when you look at the interaction effect, the confidence interval, because of this number of 5,000 here, the confidence interval is so wide that you haven't learned anything whatsoever about the uh, pharmacogenomic hypothesis. So from this, we don't know whether the variant gives you a differential 36% um, improvement of the treatment effect or a differential 43% worsening of the treatment effect. You don't really know. I mean, that is a, that's just like the whole range of uncertainty here. Uh, so the bottom line is you don't know anything. And all the paper reported was the, this p-value of 0.8 saying um, no evidence of a different treatment effect. And so this is a real misinterpretation of the p-value, as has been much discussed on Twitter, um, because you should be quoting this, these two numbers. So this is your basis of evidence in the frequentist world. So what evidence do we have? Well, we have no evidence at all, except that they spent a lot of money genotyping 5,000 patients, and they have absolutely nothing to show for it. So uh, real problems, but this is one of the best studies done in this world, which is kind of scary. But I think it's very telling either about what researchers are thinking or about just our statistical education that this number here was never in the paper. There's no point in the paper where they tested and even calculated the point estimate for the main question for the whole study. So the main question for the whole study is what's the difference in treatment effect for the, those with a genetic variant versus those without. So this, this interaction effect, which would be the double difference on the log hazard ratio scale or ratio of ratios on the hazard ratio scale, this never appeared in the paper. And because that never appeared in the paper, these never appeared in the paper. So to leave it with just this is really amazing to me that researchers would actually waste the money of the study to that extent um, and leave us with very little knowledge. So enough preaching. But you can see that the sort of model that you're doing is, would, be, would be this sort of model. You, have, um, you would have a treatment effect. You would have a um, genetic variant effect. And you'd have a treatment effect. And then you would have a differential treatment effect. Uh, if you had the genetic variant. So it would be exactly this model, it, it, but it would not be expected value. It would be a Cox model for survival time. So um, it's also interesting in that study that the apparent effect of the treatment, this is the group they're, they're supposed to have not much of an effect in. We actually have a better observed clinical effect in those who were supposed to have the worse effect. So it actually went backwards. And because of stuff like this, when the FDA issued a black box warning for clopidogrel saying that it should not be used unless the patient is genotyped, uh, the FDA can't believe they did that. And they are actually very, very angry that that black box warning is still there for clopidogrel. So any questions about interactions? So this is just going one step further. You're interacting a binary variable with a continuous variable. It's helpful to write it out in pieces like this. So you, you essentially have one model for males and a separate model for uh, females, except they're not totally separate models uh, because they have a parameter in common, which is the sigma parameter. So the residual variance sigma squared is going to be estimated from the combined model and you get a better estimate than if you were to fit a separate equation for males and females. But other than that, it's, it's a separate equation. And so this is what you're, you're showing if you allow for interaction. Um, if you, your main effect is going to shift the intercept by beta 2, but your interaction effect is going to shift the slope by beta 3.
Any questions about interaction stuff, how to interpret them, how to model them? And this is a, a really different topic, and um, I'm hoping you'll put some discussion about this on data methods because it's this is something that deserves a lot of discussion and it's very controversial. But the um, the sort of bottom line here is that people are doing external validations that are worse than internal validations, and they're saying that they're they're doing it right. And that is really, really, really wrong. So if you do an external validation on an inappropriate sample or a sample that's really small, uh, it's very easy to show statistically that, a, that an internal validation done well is going to be more reliable than the external validation. Um, and so we, we see a lot of this being done as data splitting and when you do data splitting from one source of data, that is not external validation. That is internal validation that's being mislabeled. Um, if you do it more externally by splitting on time or place, you create a different problem. And this is extremely poorly understood in, in medicine and epidemiology, and I don't know what other fields. And the reason this is so misunderstood is that people are viewing a failure to validate. You have a model in the US and you, you test it in the UK and you get very disappointed that it doesn't seem to have a good calibration curve in the UK. And so you label the model as failing to validate and it may be nothing more than the fact that UK has a different health system and it has different types of people than the US. And so instead of calling that a failure to validate, I would call that a failure to model because you should have modeled um, either geographic or genetic makeup or ethnic, whatever, or modeled the healthcare system availability. That should have been in the model. That should not be a reason to fail. It should be a reason to succeed. And likewise, I've seen even my own university, people splitting in time and finding a model doesn't work in 2019, and it was developed in 2010 to 2018. And so in, they would say the model doesn't validate. I would say, well, there's a time trend. And you could have easily modeled the time trend just like you model the age of the patients. Just put calendar time in the model, allow it to be nonlinear, and then when you want to use the model, just put in 2019 as the value you're predicting for not 2010. So for 2020, we're going to use 2019 as the basis of our predictions, where we may not assume the model is going to extrapolate linearly for all time, but that's going to give you a way more accurate prediction than if you used a trend and just inserted 2019 as the prediction when you're predicting for 2020. So it's usually best to use all available data at the analysis time and leave the external validation for newly collected data. Um, and I think rigorous internal validation should be done first. And that's assuming that you have the computational power to repeat all of your analytical steps that we're using supervised learning. Uh, those have to be repeated like 400 times. So you have to do 400 versions of your analysis to give everything that you examine an opportunity to be re-examined, including transformations. Uh, so the bootstrap is really good at that. And then you can do experiments to show that data splitting is not good. So this example where I had 17,000 patients and I had a mortality of 30%, that data set was not big enough for uh, data splitting to work. So I got, I got different, um, different results when I split as, again and repeated the whole thing. You can also see that if you use the test data as training data and use the training data as test data, so if you just, you just swap the roles of the two samples and start over and you get a different result, you know you're in trouble. So, um, 
Data splitting takes an amazingly big sample, much bigger than 17,000 subjects, to really be reliable. It's a highly imprecise, volatile method. And then we have this, um, this very interesting and philosophical point, which is only when the model is pre-specified does external validation really validate the model. Because when the model is derived using feature selection or machine learning, uh, the holdout sample is not honest in a certain sense. So you can show that your predictions hold up, uh, but the predictions come from an example model and you could easily have had different models. And so you're picking just one model and the feature selection methods that are available are not accurate. They, they don't have any high likelihood of selecting the right features. So the model that you're settling on at the end is so unlikely to be the right model. It's amazing. Uh, Mike has thought a lot about this. And um, so the process doesn't recognize that the model being validated is an example model. Whereas resampling is actually more honest and it recognizes the, the model is not the model, but it's a process used to develop predictions. And so, Resampling is validating the process uh, that was used to derive the full the so-called final model. It's not it's not um, validating the final model per se, but as a byproduct, it does estimate the likely future performance of the model that resulted from that process. This, to me, is a very hard concept for most people to get. Um, and there's a lot more written about it. And Aval Steyerberg's book, Clinical Prediction Models, is really phenomenal uh, for this topic. Um, so this just goes into more detail about that and um, more detail about that 17,000 thing. And let's see, what else do I have here? It's a lot of things you have to take into account when you're doing validation. This is just restating in different words. This is when I think you really need external validation. Uh, I don't know that I stated, oh, this, this, is, this is one reason you need external validation is you inherently do not trust the model developers. Uh, so if you don't have a level of trust in them, in other words, if they keep doing over, they get a disappointing model, they do it over and they finally publish the one that they liked, they got lucky, if, if you don't trust them to not do that, then you might need an external validation. Um, but this is the main reason people do external validation is when the, the methods of measurement change um, and you want to validate the generalizability of the model developed on a certain platform. This could be a proteomic, genomic, microbiome uh, imaging platform that may vary with hardware and, and other things. Um, you might have lab conditions that vary. Um, external validation is good when you have really big training data and really big test data, both. Um, I think the, the other points about validation that maybe I didn't cover yet are that um, internal validation, if you do it rigorously, is something that you can do much earlier in the process than external validation. And to me, it is a major strategic error to invest a lot of money and wait two more years uh, to publish a study, waiting for an external validation, if there's a chance that the external validation is not going to, is not going to validate. And so what a shame it would be to not have done an internal validation that showed that you were unstable and didn't validate that saves you the time and money of doing an external validation. So I think the internal validation should be done first. And most of the examples where the external validation did not work, when it's not a geographical or time difference that should have been modeled, most of these occasions can be predicted by a good statistician. So we can predict something that's not going to validate from the experimental design and the analytic approach. 
So if it's pretty predictable, why do we keep getting disappointed? People keep having optimism, hoping something's going to validate. And uh, instead of that, we could have done a strong internal validation, find out it doesn't validate, and save a whole lot of time. So um, there's another point made somewhere in here, and there's some great resources here. And I forgot where I, where I made the point, but um, one of the best things you can do in this world of predictive modeling is to validate the researchers. Instead of validating the model, I think it's probably more important to validate the researchers. Some of the worst scandals uh, in the history of um, biomarker research in medicine, such as the Pody scandal at Duke University, uh, you would have detected the fraud instantly if they had had the guts to give the data and the algorithm to an independent team and just say, can you get the same answer as us using our data and using our plan for analysis, can you repeat our answers? You would have found the answer was a resounding no, that from their data and their algorithms, you could not even repeat what they got because they had a problem with their software and you get a different answer depending on the time of day that the software was run. So um, I think we need to do validation by independent research teams uh, more than we need independent data. And that's a way to detect problems really early. So any discussion, those are really hot topics. Any discussion about any of this, please somebody chime in. Mike, is it as bad as I usually say it is? Um, well, <laughs> uh, at least in our group, um, you know, we have maybe three to four analysts <clears throat> and we try very hard to independently replicate our own work, you know, so we'll, we try to have a, you know, we, we try to follow a strict protocol, first of all, of having a, a detailed SAP for every analysis. And that's difficult because we have sometimes senior people will pull an analyst aside and say, hey, can you do this or that? Uh, but we try to control that. <clears throat> and then beyond that, when, when someone is working on a project, <clears throat> we'll, we'll share that data and we'll try to have two folks, you know, we'll try to have the, uh, a second person from scratch, see if they can replicate what that person found. <clears throat> um, you know, so, you know, it's the best we can do, but I don't think, well, you know, there are time pressures, <clears throat> there are deadline pressures, and it's not always easy to do. Uh, you know, it's a lot more work. <clears throat> And uh, I don't think a lot of the groups where I am do the same thing. So, no, I, I think it's, it's pretty bad out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty scared by what I see. Anybody else want to add anything to that discussion? Can I, just, can I ask a quick question? Oh, yeah. Would you be able to detect these problems even beforehand via the data collection and analysis plan? If it's all specified in there, is that, you know, if I were to give, for example, a statistician my data analysis plan and say, you know, do you see any major flaws in this? Would you be able to detect any sort of validation issues by just by looking at the plan? Sarah, that's a fantastic question. My, my experience is you can detect it about three quarters of the time. Okay. And uh, so just one way to answer that is we have a way of writing grant proposals with a level of specificity in the analytic plans where we will list the candidate variables, what we're assuming about the variables and how many degrees of freedom each one gets. Uh, are we assuming linearity or are we, are we relaxing that? And so we have this whole template of um, how we write analytic plans that I think it really, um, requires a lot of thinking before you get the money to do the grant, but yeah. it, and it, and it really directs you to not have this Andrew Gilman garden of forking paths. Uh, but of course, the easiest way to detect a problem is if the analytic plan has a misspelling in it. And so I've seen analytic plans that said, we will do multivariant analysis with an N. Multivariant analysis, that was a whole analytic plan and they don't even know that it's not 
is not multivariant is multivariate and it's not multivariate it's multivariable and yeah. so or i'll see a plan that says we will do logistical regression so you can pretty much depend on uh, that not being a team that's going to come through for you uh, but it's usually not that obvious so the, the next thing that makes it obvious is if they say that their analytic plan is that they're going to use SPSS or SAS. Uh, I almost never see a good outcome when that is the main part of the analytic plan. Plus, I see that the result is they always assume everything's linear because SPSS and SAS make it harder to, to not assume everything is linear. So there's various clues, uh, but if, you, if they don't pay any attention to how the outcome variable is transformed, and they don't mention that, and you know they have an opportunity to play with a lot of transformations. If they are going to do traditional variable selection and not use penalization, that is usually a prediction of major problems. If they ever mention that they're doing univariate screening, uh, you can expect a disaster to unfold. So we have these various predictors and, and they're so predictable that I actually wrote R code for reviewing journal articles uh, that I use. And so the, the problems that I'm seeing are so common that I just, I have each problem with uh, a little R object that contains the description of the project and it contains the references in the literature that they need to know about. And I'll just list the R objects in my R markdown review and it, it writes out all of the, I just list all of the errors that I see and I erase the errors that they didn't make. And so the result is a full, a full review. Uh, and then I preface it with things particular to their paper at the front of that. So it's, it's so bad to me that, um, that I've actually automated a lot of the review <laughs> process. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And some, sometimes we should all write a blog article about uh, how to be a detective, how to, how to, what cues to look for that are making a research project and predictive modeling destined to fail. Or in the mind of the reviewers, uh, in the minds of the investigators have no opportunity to fail. You know, the, the best scientific proposals you ever see are the ones where the investigators list all the reasons that it might fail. And the worst ones is when they don't come up with any reason that it might fail. Any other comments? Uh, I, I have one question. Um, are you, so one of the things I've really struggled with <clears throat> is explaining um, joint tests and chunk tests to colleagues and <clears throat> a little bit to trainees. Is there anything published that, that, you know, for example, that actually includes the, your, your uh, RMS ANOVA table? I'm just looking for models. I, I need to do a better job, uh, clearly. Uh, and I'm just looking for maybe some alternative ways of explaining what's happening, you know, when, <clears throat> you know, if I have a single predictor, you know, a one, a one degree of freedom predictor, um, but it's also involved in an interaction and then maybe a spline. And then, of course, you know, I see a three or four degree of freedom test in the ANOVA table. And I was just looking for me, hopefully better language that I can convey what's happening. Is there anything published or maybe I missed something in, in uh, text? The, the examples that I can think of. So <clears throat> if you, uh, we've written a lot of papers in the um, neurosurgery literature related to spine surgery. Uh, uh, where we're predicting disability after spine surgery. And so we have all of these classes of variables like various disability indexes and, you know, were you working full time before you had your back surgery? And in those papers, we have a, a really standard uh, reporting scheme. And most of our models have about 60, 60 variables in them. And in many of those, when you see the, wow. you see these dot charts <clears throat> that show the Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And those dot charts often have an extra dot added for the chunk uh, contribution of a group uh -huh. of variables. So if you look at any any paper I've written that's in the um, that's in the spine surgery back surgery uh, 
neurosurgery <laughs> world, uh, it has a lot of examples like that. Great, but one of the examples great. I use teaching a lot, it, the simple example is you have total cholesterol and you have LDL cholesterol. And I think that's in the textbook too. And you know, what mm -hmm. problems you get into when you try to hold one of those constant. Right, right. Okay, great, great, thanks. Yeah, good question. And, and we do need to be a little more systematic about this in terms of um, giving more examples in reporting. And, I, and I, I'm working, been working with writing some statistical guidelines for reporting in the medical literature. And I don't think we cover this topic very well. So thanks for bringing it up. Sure. Well, I want to thank you all for being here, and okay. I, I think I am going to try to save a recording of this. I did start recording at the beginning uh, for other people to see, but please follow up with questions on data methods and hope to see you uh, the next time we get together. And everybody, please stay safe. Yes. Thank you. Bye. You too, Frank. Take weekend. care. Okay. We'll see you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.